É, eu queria, a gente reuniu uma turma da pesada para dar um, um, um entorno aqui do ao Brian. Eu queria chamar o Hermano Viana, Arthur Lindsay, Ale Youssef, para a gente entrevistar um pouco o Brian e deixar ele... Vamos lá. E, Hermano, o Hermano preparou um, um, um speech para introduzir um pouco do Brian Eno em contexto antes da gente começar. E Brian Eno. Passa para lá, tudo. Thank you. Bem-vindo. Welcome. Thank you. Obrigado. É uma alegria e um desafio estar aqui. Eu agradeço muito o convite do Marcelo. É, esse projeto do Outras Ideias para o Rio é incrível. É um privilégio a gente ter todas essas obras espalhadas pela cidade e já se misturando com a vida da cidade. Ontem eu vim ver... A, 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 a primeira projeção do, do, das 67 milhões de pessoas e estar na Lapa, né, cercado por toda essa história da Lapa e vendo aquilo e interagindo com os sons da Lapa é, foi muito bacana. É, eu sou é um desafio estar aqui porque é, é, quando ele me fez esse convite eu entrei em pânico e até por isso eu sugeri de trazer minha gangue, meu coletivo para é, me ajudar nessa tarefa, porque eu sou um seguidor do Brian muito antes do Twitter existir. né? Então, a, a importância é, do, da obra do Brian, do pensamento do Brian uh, na, na, na minha vida e, na, e nas coisas que eu acho interessantes no mundo é fundamental. O que eu preparei antes é, para situar um pouco quem é uh, uh, Brian Nino e, e a importância dele, é, eu Sou uh, bem fã, tô, então trouxe o livro, uh, que é um diário que ele lançou e que tem uma coletânea de, de, de muito interessante de vários textos importantes que ele escreveu no final também, e termina com a autobiografia dele, que é, uh, é o texto que eu vou me basear para fazer essa mini biografia dele aqui. E trouxe também uh, dois discos, que depois eu vou pedir autógrafo, uh, o, um que eu acho que é muito importante, que fundamental nessa conversa que a gente tá, tem hoje e para a, a instalação que ele fez, que é o Música para Aeroportos. E depois é, o No New York, que ele produziu, que, tem a, é, é, que foi o primeiro disco é, que lançou uma banda do Arthur, e o Arthur é o nosso convidado também de honra, também ídolo. É, o Brian Nino nasceu em 1948, numa cidade chamada Woodbridge, é, na costa leste da Inglaterra. É, o pai dele era, trabalhava nos Correios, é, era um carteiro, e é, é interessante isso, é, é, eu sempre pensei no fato da, da coincidência do Caetano Veloso também ser filho de um... É, o pai dele também trabalhava no Correio, ele foi criado numa família ligada ao Correio, e sempre foi um sonho meu ver o, 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 o Brian trabalhando com o Caetano, eu acho que isso ainda vai acontecer alguma vez na vida. E teve até um encontro promovido pelo Arthur, né? uma vez tem essa gravação, Caetano e Arthur é, tocando é, terra, e o, 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 o Brian processando os sonhos, é, isso, espero que isso um dia seja lançado. E a mãe uh, do Brian era belga, um imigrante belga na Inglaterra. E é, é tão é, é, é interessante essa conexão da Bélgica, né, do continente com a ilha, que eu, que eu fico imaginando o, o, o parecido que acontece aqui, a, a, a comparação que a gente pode ter. É, é tão estranho quanto a mãe etíope do Jorge Benjó no Brasil. É, 
Ele cresceu nessa cidade pequena, a família dele, grande parte da família dele ainda mora nessa região, é, e ele foi, é, é, acho que por causa da mãe dele, ele, é, a primeira escola dele foi uma escola católica, e essa situação é, de ter uma educação católica num país anglicano já marca um, um, uma diferença de, 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 de criação e de, 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 de personalidade que também vai influenciar a, a, a obra dele depois. Tem uma entrevista que o Zé Marcelo me lembrou a, a, agora, que ele fala de uma primeira experiência de música na igreja, ouvindo as pessoas cantar. E, antes dessa palestra, ele veio essa, essa preocupação, esse interesse pelo canto, é, e pelo canto a capela continua presente muito na vida dele. Ele veio me perguntar aqui, é, antes, sobre tradições brasileiras a capela. Se vocês tiverem alguma informação também para dar para ele, é, é, ele está muito interessado nisso, continua interessado. Aí, logo depois, essa escola é, é, que ele estudou era uma escola salesiana, e até depois é, é, esse nome, São João Batista de La Salle, passou a ser parte do nome dele completo. É, e, depois disso, ele foi para uma escola de arte, que é uma instituição bem britânica, muito interessante da Inglaterra, que hoje enfrenta problemas né, na, na, no meio da crise econômica europeia em geral, mas é uma instituição muito importante, que formou muitos do, 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 dos músicos de música pop, mas de muitos artistas que fazem parte hoje que, que, do nosso imaginário e tudo mais. Então, é, é essa experiência na... Na, na escola de arte, ele teve grandes professores, por exemplo, o Roy Ascot, é, o Neil Foster, várias pessoas muito, que, que são muito importantes, que eram professores e que apresentaram para ele muitas coisas. Por exemplo, o Noel Foster, eu acredito que tenha sido o professor que apresentou a Gavin Bryars, que é um compositor de música contemporânea em inglesa, que levou o, o, o Brian a, a tocar num assim que é, juntava músicos e não músicos, e essa experiência, esse conhecimento com a, as várias ideias da música contemporânea e das artes plásticas veio dessa experiência na escola de arte inglesa. Eu acho que a escola que ele estudou, é, perto da cidade dele, até foi a escola onde várias pessoas estudaram, inclusive, por exemplo, Pitausen estudou na mesma escola, é, e... É, é, eu já li algumas entrevistas que ele fala da influência de música pop também nele e de, da importância do Who, uh, da banda do Pete Townsend, também da importância do, do, do Velvet Underground nessa época. Aí ah, depois é, de sair da universidade, ele sai da universidade em 1969 em, é, e vai para Londres. E tem vários amigos e um amigo importante da época da universidade é o Andy McKay, que tocou boé depois no, no, no Roxy Music e que foi a pessoa que o levou para a banda Roxy Music. Tem até a história de um encontro no metrô, que o metrô estava saindo, que se ele, ele já declarou que se não tivesse tido esse encontro e, e se ele tivesse chegado naquela estação uns momentos depois, ele seria hoje um professor de arte, não é, o, o produtor, não músico, músico que ele é. é, é então, é, logo depois do, do, do Roxy Music, ele... É, fez é, é, ele começou a carreira solo é, gravou é, é, vários discos muito importantes é, lançou o manifesto da música ambiente é, e também começou a produzir muita gente na lista de produções dele é incrível tem de, de John Cale que ele vai ter uma conexão muito importante depois logo depois do Roxy Music é, fazendo a ponte com o que ele escutava antes com Velvet Underground, é, mas John Cage, é, Talking Heads, é, tem a trilogia é, de Berlim, do David Bowie, e também a, 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 as viagens que ele faz, né, de morar é, em Berlim numa hora muito importante, morar em Nova York, morar em São Petersburgo, ficar circulando por, pelo mundo, é, e, e participando das cenas locais, isso também é muito importante. É, o que tem muita coisa para falar da, da obra dele, o currículo dele é incrível e 
ele está assim, em, em tantos momentos tão importantes da cultura contemporânea, da cultura pop contemporânea, é, mas é, talvez a gente começar logo a conversar com ele é, de, de a, a, a primeira questão, o primeiro assunto seria a instalação que ele está faz, fazendo aqui no Rio, né? que quem não é, veio... É, tem que vir, é, e até eu já vi pessoas que vieram ontem que vão vir todos os dias e já estão planejando uma ocupação do Brian Eno, trazer piquenique e fazer outras coisas e se apropriar de, de, desse espaço da cidade. É, então, é, dele falar um pouco da gênese e também eu acho que é interessante ele falar do equipamento que ele usa, do software que ele usa para, é, para essa instalação e de como essa instalação é, está integrada na obra dele e, 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 e como a experiência do Rio tem sido para ele ah, agora. Thank you. Um, I don't speak Portuguese. I'm very sorry. Um, let me take this off for a moment. But I shall try to speak slowly and clearly. And there's a very kind lady in the box there who's translating. So if you want to hear what I'm saying and you don't speak good English, you could... Uh, are those machines available everywhere for, for people? Yeah, okay. So, hello. And <laughs> I'm very happy to be here in Brazil. I heard most of what he said, but most of that I've heard before because it's my life. Um, um, So what I would like to talk about is why I'm doing this and what I'm doing here. It's very uncomfortable sitting down, so do you mind if I stand up? Yeah. Um, so I was invited by Marcello Dantas to make this piece. Um, and it, it, I think it, the idea really came from a piece I made in um, Sydney, Australia, for the uh, Sydney festival of 2009 where I painted the sails of the Sydney Opera House in a similar way to this. So we had a little bit of experience in doing this kind of large-scale work. Since we had that experience, of course, projector technology has improved, so we now have even more powerful projectors. There are six of them used in this show. The show is the latest point in a series of works I've been doing over the last, well, since I left art school really, um, so over the last 40 years now. Um, and I call, I call both the music and the visual side of this generative art. Now, for those of you who don't know what that word means, generative means self-making. It means something that comes into existence as it makes itself. So to give you an example, a, a comparison, if you think of traditional classical composition, you imagine the composer is something like an architect. The composer specifies every detail of the music and uh, the orchestra is there to play that music in those exact details. That's what musical notation is about, the attempt to cover all of the sonic possibilities of the music. Am I talking okay? Not too fast? Thank you. Um, the kind of music that I've been making since the 70s doesn't work like that. Instead of trying to specify everything in detail, what I'm doing is trying to design a sort of system, a machine or a process of some kind, which will produce music for me. Um, and then I tweak the system until it starts making more like the music I want to hear. Um, so for instance, uh, a very simple generative piece of music would be a set of wind chimes. When you hang up a set of wind chimes, you don't actually know what they're going to play but by their design and the place that you've hung them, you've sort of made a musical decision. So, so you, you've defined the envelope of possibilities within which that music can exist. 
Does everyone know what wind chimes are, by the way? Yeah, okay. So, you never know. They might not have them in Brazil, for all I know. They've probably got better taste here than they have wind chimes. <laughs> um, so, so, a very simple example of a, of a generative piece of music is a set of wind chimes. Well, what I'm doing is a little bit more complicated than that, but it works on the same principle. I'm establishing a set of possibilities and then allowing them to happen, allowing them to carry themselves out. Therefore, every performance of a, something like that is different from the one before. You know, the wind chimes are never going to exactly duplicate the performance they did last night. Similarly, my pieces never exactly duplicate. The way this piece works is um, we have a piece of software which we wrote, which is constantly choosing between banks of images that I've produced over the last 30 years or so. And it's overlaying random sets of those images, one on top of the other. And there are various other parts of the process that are randomized. For instance, how quickly an image appears, how long it stays, how quickly it goes away. Um, and at any moment, you can see up to five different layers. Now, because we have something like um, 250 basic images in here, in this particular show, that means that the number of combinations is absolutely vast. It's much more than 77 million, actually. It's, it's in the billions of possibilities. So, effectively, this show will never repeat itself though, of course, all of its possibilities are known in advance or knowable in advance. So this works uh, very much like the kind of music that I've been doing. The record you showed there, Music for Airports, is, is made in the same kind of way. It's a, it's a small set of possibilities which are shuffled um, and continually reshuffle themselves. Okay, so I shall now shut up and let all these other many, many people on the stage who've come to try to discover the truth um, <laughs> ask me some questions. Thank you. Posso, uh, eu queria passar a palavra para o Arthur, uh, ele falar um pouco da, uh, do encontro com, com, com Brian Eno no final dos anos 70, em Nova York, da, de como é ser produzido pelo Brian Eno e da longa história que os dois têm de colaboração, de, de troca de ideias. Assim, a, a, a foto mais recente do Arthur que eu vi na internet era num jantar que foi em homenagem ao Craig Venter, do Projeto Genoma, e ao Brian Eno, na Itália. Então, eles estão sempre em contato. Eu queria que, que o Arthur falasse, contasse um pouco para a gente de como que isso aconteceu e como que isso tem acontecido. Bem, é, português, inglês, português. You're listening, right? Um, o Brian produziu a primeira gravação da minha primeira banda, DNA, e foi uma experiência muito interessante, porque, sendo a minha primeira gravação, foi muito emocional para mim, e chorei depois, porque aquela experiência daquilo que a gente faz ao vivo ser gravado, de alguma forma, não vai desaparecer nunca mais, pelo menos vai durar um tempo. E, enquanto isso, o Brian, muito relaxado, é, lendo alguma revista e... I also remember that story. Um, e prestando atenção em coisas que eu não imaginaria que fossem importantes para uma gravação. É, deixando a gente gravar e observando, escutando é, de uma maneira, para mim, muito nova, o que a gente estava fazendo. E não guiando a gente mas um, iluminando, de alguma forma, o processo de gravação. 
E antes disso ter acontecido, é, Brian é um grande não sei, fazedor de frases. E uma dessas frases é que the studio is an instrument. O estúdio de gravação é um instrumento. Isso para mim foi uma grande revelação. É, na hora da primeira gravação, eu não lembrei disso, eu estava muito envolvido comigo mesmo. <risos> mas mas um, minha carreira de produtor provém dessa, desse insight, dessa, desculpe falar inglês no meio do português, desse, dessa percepção. Né? Mas eu não acho tão interessante falar sobre mim, eu nem... Um, eu queria perguntar ao Brian sobre como esse disco aqui é um exemplo de... How is this generative? Como, como é que é generative esse aqui, esse disco? How, what's the generative process you use to make this particular record? Ok, um, thank you. Oh, sorry, I've got to switch this off now, or else I hear myself. Um, <laughs> Okay, there are four pieces on music for airports, and they're, they're actually each made in a slightly different way, but I'll give you, I'll talk about one of them, um, the simplest one, because it's the easiest one to understand the generative process. Um, I simply put together a small group of singers, I think there were three, three singers, and myself, um, and played a note on the piano, We sang one note, I recorded it, I made a long loop of that one note. That's to say, I, I cut a long piece of tape, um, which was perhaps, you know, 35 seconds long, and the, piece, the single note was on that 35 seconds for eight seconds or six seconds. I made five loops like that, or six, I can't remember. And then I had six tape players, each with the loop running through it. They were, it was in a room about as big as this. The loops of tape were running around the, around the um, legs of tables and chairs. So it looked pretty fantastic. I wish I had a photograph. <laughs> yeah, it sounds beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it was lovely. And so, so I just started all the machines and all the loops started running. And the loops were all different lengths, that's, that's the important part. Which meant that the repetition was a different length of time with each loop. Which meant that the music was constantly clustering together into different chords. And uh, then I recorded, at that time of course, I couldn't sell the system, which is what I'd like to do. So I had to sell a recording of the system, which is this. Um, So now, of course, we've moved to a different point in history, and now I can sell the system. And in fact, this is what I'm doing now. I recently have released an app called Scape, which is a generative music system, which you can download for a trivial £3.99. pence. <laughs> it's, it's really, it should be... It's so interesting to me, the world of apps, because really that thing ought to cost £40,000 or something. It's, it's two 400, years' work. £400,000. £400,000, why not? Four million. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's made me redundant, because if you have this app, I don't have to make any more records. <laughs> Come on now. I, before I... Pastor Baton, antes de passar o microfone, uh, I wanted to ask you, as a producer, as my producing mentor, um, in the past we've talked about different producers that you enjoyed. I remember when you used to, when you were really in love with the bass line for Waterfall, remember by TLC? Yes. And I was wondering who if anybody you, you enjoy listening to right now as a producer? Well, a lot of the most interesting producers are also the most interesting artists right now. So, for instance, I heard something 
the other day by a young guy from, I think, Toronto, I'm not sure, who calls himself Port St. Willow. <laughs> has anybody heard of this person? Port St. Willow. And he has a song called Am Awake. Am Awake. But it's all one word, so I don't know what it means. But I heard this song and I thought, that is amazing. I've never heard anything like it though I can't identify anything that is really new about it. It's, it's the same cards that we all know about, but he shuffled them in a very interesting way. So I thought, I must find out about this guy, and I must find out who produced this. <laughs> it's the same guy. He played every single instrument. He recorded it. It's one person. Um, and this, this very often happens now. So some of the best producers are not calling themselves producers. They call themselves things like Port St. Willow. Right. <laughs> How do you discover new music now? Uh, I have um, two systems for discovering new music. Um, one is called Carruthers. And Carruthers is a friend of mine called John Carruthers. And he's in my singing group. Um, and every month, he sends me one or two or three CDs of stuff he thinks I would like to listen to. But he doesn't tell me who is singing or playing. He just sends me the CDs with no notes. And he sends me the notes a month later. So I listen without prejudice. Do you understand? I just hear things, sometimes they're very poppy things, sometimes they're very obscure, but I don't know the names of anybody. So that's how I heard Port St. Willow, actually. It was on one of his CDs. So that's one way I do it. And the other way I do it is thanks to the BBC. Now, being Brazilian, you unfortunately don't have a BBC. Um, that you could have a Brazilian broadcasting company, but the BBC is, is one of the um, only things left in England, aside from black cabs, that really is something to be proud of, I think. And the BBC has a program on, called Radio 6. Radio 6 has managed to survive playing a lot of very obscure and interesting music. So, on Saturday mornings, I put on Radio 6. And I listen for the whole morning <laughs> and take notes of things that interest me. But we can stream the BBC now. <laughs> you should listen to Radio 6. Yeah. Uma pergunta, nós nos dividimos, mais ou menos, não tem um, um, um critério rígido, mas eu fiquei com as perguntas mais de música, Uh, o Zé Marcelo sobre cultura digital uh, e o Ronaldo sobre arte e o Alexandre sobre uh, política, ativismo, novas formas de ativismo hoje. Uh, nós trabalhamos juntos, fizemos o Overmundo, que é um site de colaboração sobre cultura brasileira. Foi uma experiência muito rica e é por isso que a gente está junto aqui hoje. Uh, mas, uh, então, uh, fazendo minha primeira pergunta, uh, o Roxy Music, uh, o primeiro disco do Roxy Music está completando 40 anos este ano. <risos> eu, eu, eu sabia que, oh, interesting. Yes. Que, 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 que ia ser a sua reação. Mas uh, eu li o, 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 uh, o artigo do Simon Reynolds falando sobre a influência do Roxy Music. Uh, e ele dizia que, enquanto uh, o visual da banda não tinha envelhecido bem, uh, o som era cada vez mais influente. E, e falando de algumas canções como Bob, Bob's Man, e, e, e coisas que têm mais conexão com o seu trabalho de hoje. Mas eu fiquei pensando se eu concordo realmente que o visual não envelheceu bem que não tem a mesma influência. Talvez porque o espírito do tempo está mais conectado com a forma do som que o Roxy Music produziu do que com aquele tipo de visual que vocês usaram naquela época. 
Outro dia eu estava no, em Londres, no Victoria and Albert Museum, eu vi aquela sua roupa de penas e, e, e tudo mais. E eu fiquei pensando, é, é, você quando vê aquela roupa, você reconhece a pessoa que usava aquela roupa? E onde que essa pessoa está? Se ela ainda é... é, 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 é se, se tem influência na... na, na, na porque parece assim que, num determinado momento, o mesmo seu estilo visual ficou ah, aquele barroco que existiu, o excesso eh, e o minimalismo. Se existe uma conexão entre esses dois mundos visuais que você trabalhou? Ok. Sorry, I'm just having a conversation with the translator here. Uh, desculpa se eu falei também muito rápido. Um, oh dear. <laughs> I'm so uninterested in this subject. It's it's quite hard for me to pretend I'm interested. Um, it's such a long time ago, and I I I don't know what to say to you really. You know, I I would like to be courteous and pretend that I'm fascinated by my own history, but I'm not, actually. Um, in fact, mostly I'm, I want to forget it, because I, I find it much easier to think about what I'm doing now if I don't have the weight of a lot of history on me. Because the main, the, the main problem with success is that it's a kind of heavy jacket that you carry around with you. And it's a jacket of people saying, why don't you do any more records like that really good one you did 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 40 years ago, or whatever. W whenever they stop listening is the time that they like them. And, you know, of course you don't want to disappoint people. It's not, it's not a nice feeling to think you're doing things that people don't like, or that you've let them down in some way. So I just don't really even want to hear from them, basically. And, <laughs> and I don't even really want to talk about it very much. Um, I was quote, misquoted in the newspaper the other day. Um, somebody interviewing me asked me whether I would like to be part of a Roxy Music reunion. And I said to her that I would sooner have hot nails driven through my balls But unfortunately, when they translated it, they used the wrong word for nails. I meant those kinds of nails that, that Christ was crucified with. But they translated it as fingernails, which... <laughs> that sounds, sounds much better, actually. And maybe that service is available in Rio somewhere. <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't answered your question, but I, I can't. Não, mas você respondeu. Excuse me. <laughs> But can, you. can we have... There's so many people on this stage and uh, so, somebody else has got to say something. Otherwise, I'll feel rude. Okay, well, I think I have my own microphone here. Well, first of all, uh, I think sometimes you like to describe yourself as an accountant. And I heard that and I liked it. I thought it was a great uh, synthesis of some things that you do. So my question uh, is actually two very quick questions. The first one is about an interview you gave to Kevin Kelly uh, from Wired Magazine in the 90s, in which you said that the problem with computers is that they don't have enough Africa in them. And then that you could actually say that you can describe a nerd, uh, someone that is a computer geek, also by the fact that they don't have enough Africa in them. Yeah. So my question is, We are moving into a society in, in which we are transcending computers. We are using like smartphones, tablets, and also like the Internet of Things that are, you know, forthcoming. Do you think we got more Africa into computers right now? Yeah. Um, so what I meant by that, of course, was that the the whole develop the whole trajectory of the development of computers has been towards using one muscle that one, and forgetting all of these other muscles. So there, straight away, you abandon four million years of human evolution. 
and you, you focus everything through this tiny narrow channel of yes or no, click, click, click. And to me that seems to be the whole problem with computers and with the kind of art that comes out of computers. It has no reference to muscles. Now, for instance, an artist like Arto is, is a very muscular artist. He doesn't look very muscular, he looks quite, quite weedy, but his muscles are a big part of what he does. And what tends to happen when you give people a computer is that they immediately fall into the language of the computer, which is the language of careful, small movements. Um, not careless large movements or even careful large movements. Um, and it seems to me that so much of the art and architecture and music that's come out of the use of computers has suffered from abandoning every part of the body below the neck. It's, it's turned it into something like classical music. For me, that was the whole problem with classical music, that it didn't work below the neck. And now we've somehow argued ourselves into another version of music that doesn't work below the neck. The only way we get anything to happen below the neck is by making it really, really loud. Um, but, but it isn't in the construction of the music. Um, so the second question is, is an interesting one, which I hadn't thought about before, which is whether the new technologies we have are more, shall we say, African. <laughs> and yes, I, I think they are. For, for example, the interface is much, much, much better. The, the interface uses your finger in a different way, not in the little clicky, clicky way. I hate that movement. It makes me think of someone picking their nose. You know, it's, it's such a tiny, trivial, pathetic movement. Um, and it has no, no sort of human feeling in it at all. I mean, I, I have to say, I work on computers all the time, so I'm not a, I'm not a Luddite saying that I don't like the whole technology. All of that is run from computers. A lot of my music is as well. But I'm constantly fighting this tendency that computers have to make you make safe, logical, sensible choices. When I see people in the studio working with Pro Tools, which perhaps some of you don't know what Pro Tools is, it's a contemporary, the contemporary recording medium. What I notice all the time is that they're constantly correcting things. They're saying, oh, that bar, the drums are a little bit off. So let's take that bar, we'll cut it out carefully, and we'll put it back in in place of this one. And the other day I was listening to the radio, and I heard a Dire Straits song. It was um, Sultan of Swing. Do you know that song? And I was listening to it, and suddenly there was a wrong note on the guitar. I thought, aha, uh -huh. that, <laughs> that must have been recorded before Pro Tools. <laughs> because that would not survive now. That wouldn't be there any longer. Now engineers have become sort of not just accountants, they've become sort of little bureaucrats who, whose job is to straighten everything up and make everything look perfectly neat. Um, and thank God most of the records I grew up with didn't have that kind of attention. You think of Fela Kuti's records, think of them being recorded now by you know, contemporary recording engineers. It would have been the death of West African music, straight off. But, yes, so the, the new technologies are a little bit better, partly because they employ a little bit more muscularity, but also because the feedback loop is very fast. So, taking photographs now is a lot more fun. Taking photographs is a social event now. You take a picture, then you all look at it. So it's part of the moment, it's part of now, not part of the future. But we've still got a long way to go. And it's really, you know, it's Brazilians should be designing computers, not West Coast Americans. They are going to fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, you have a point. Sorry, sorry, Arthur. But you're East Coast. <laughs> É, vamos lá, 
uh, circulando aqui pelos assuntos, que é um, um dos encantos de estar conversando com esse contador, músico, não músico, que é o, o Brian, né? Tem, em inglês, diríamos, uma pessoa renascentista para esse para essa capacidade de circular por vários assuntos, por várias iniciativas. E entre essas coisas esteve está a relação com tudo isso que é da, da cultura digital, uh, da era da internet e do que isso significa para nós como indivíduos, para os nossos cérebros e para nós como coletividade. Uma coisa que o Brian uh, teve e está envolvido é com uma fundação que chama-se a The Long Now Foundation, né? a ideia de, de uma fundação voltada para o longo agora, não para o agora permanente do stream uh, do Facebook, do Twitter uh, e de outros recursos da internet, mas para um agora uh, que conta os anos com o um zero antes, nós estamos no ano zero, 2012, e que é, 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 se propõe a pensar alguns milênios para trás e para frente da nossa da nossa uh, existência. A, a Long Now Foundation tem um dos projetos, que é um site que chama-se Long Bet, que é um lugar que convida-nos a propor a, a previsões né, para o futuro próximo ou distante. É, uma outra coisa que o Brian teve sempre envolvido é com um, um, uma militância em temas globais, recentemente, toda a questão da, da guerra do Iraque, a presença da Inglaterra, do, do, dos Estados Unidos do Ocidente na guerra do Iraque, a tensão com Israel e, e as práticas recentes de, de a, a Israel. E aí eu queria um pouco fazer uma pergunta que dialoga com essas coisas todas. A internet e o agora da internet foi saudado no início como uma oportunidade para reforçar a ideia de uma consciência global e do acesso a pessoas, a assuntos, a conhecimentos do mundo inteiro instantâneo. Né? E, no entanto, às vezes hoje eu tenho a sensação que, no mundo da internet de pessoas, a gente tende a viver não só num agora permanente do stream, como num aqui permanente. Quer dizer, cada vez mais, por incrível que pareça, aquilo funciona como um vetor de insulamento e não de, 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 de olhar para o mundo. Estamos aqui, nas nossas vezes, discutindo as nossas coisas, a nossa aldeia e não a aldeia global. Às vezes me dá a sensação que um asteroide pode se chocar contra a Terra ou uma guerra nuclear pode eclodir e estaremos todos no Facebook discutindo a nossa aldeia. Então, eu queria convidar o Brian a comentar um pouco essa conexão entre esse ativista, essa consciência global e, e essa possibilidade da internet e esse paradoxo do agora e do aqui permanente. E, se for o caso, propor qual seria a long bet que ele traria uh, do dia de hoje aqui para a nossa conversa. Okay, um, sorry. The I'll just explain long bets for a moment. It's it's a very interesting process. So the Long Now Foundation was f started about 16 or 18 years ago, and we decided to try to imagine that we were in the middle of a 20,000-year period of human history. 10,000 years ago was the beginning of agriculture and settled societies. So we thought we'll start there and we'll imagine now that we're in the middle of some kind of process that will go on for another 10,000 years, so to the year 12,000. Um, and when we first started talking about this idea to people, they would say, well, how can you possibly make any kind of prediction about such, such long distances in the future. And then I would say to them, well, why do you think you can't make a prediction? And they would say, well, there could be wars, there could be plagues, there could be new technologies that we don't know about, so on and so on. All absolutely true. And of course, as soon as you start even thinking about the reasons that you can't make predictions, you're starting to think about the future. And so this was, this was the point of the Long Now Foundation, to try to get people into a frame of mind where they first of all accepted that there was a future, because a lot of people don't act as if there is, and secondly started to articulate some ideas about it. So we have one big project, which is we're building a, a huge clock in Texas, which is actually half built now, and that clock is to run for the next 10,000 years. But one of the other projects is this thing called Long Bets. Um, a lot of the people in this group are scientists, and a lot of the people who know about us are scientists. And scientists are always interested in 
thinking about their own discipline into the future. Um, and they're always arguing with each other about these things, you know. So some, some people are saying that within um, 15 years we'll have what's a machine that will pass the Turing test, which is an artificial intelligence test. Um, and then there are other scientists who say, no, no, we're at least 150 years away from that. So long now, long bets offers them a chance to bet against each other um, and long now guarantees to monitor the bet, sets up a board where it can be discussed. You should have a look at it actually, it's a very interesting part of the long now foundation. We just had a bet um, a couple of years ago, Warren Buffett bet a million dollars that he would, the Standard & Poor index would do better in the next seven years than a particular high-flying hedge fund. So far he's winning. He, he bet a million dollars on that. And um, when, when the bets are resolved, the money doesn't go to the winner, it goes to a charity of, of the winner's choice. Um, so it's a way of just stimulating discussions about the future because one of the paradoxes of humanity at the moment is that we are at the point of our maximum power. We've never been as powerful as a species as we are now. And at the same time, we've never been as short-sighted. If I tell you a story to give you an example of what long-sighted looks like, you'll get an idea. Um, about 20 years ago, the dean of New College in Oxford, which was built in 1480, that's what we call new in England, um, he was looking at the ceiling and he noticed that the huge oak beams that support the ceiling were starting to crumble. They were falling apart. So he got in touch with the head forester, because Oxford has lots and lots of forests and woods around. And he said, do we have wood to replace these beams? And the forester said, yes, we were wondering when you were going to ask about that. Because when the college was built, they planted a grove of oak trees to replace those beams. And those trees were now 500 years old and ready to cut. Um, and those, those were actually used. Those are now the beams that are used in New College Oxford. So here's, here's an example of people in the late 15th century thinking half a millennium into the future, thinking they're going to need to support this roof in 500 years' time, so we'll plant some trees. There's, there's no example really of that kind of long thinking in our culture now. We just don't do it. And, and yet we are doing things that are very powerful and will have very long echoes into the future, but without any mechanism for evaluating those or for thinking about what might be the effects. Sorry, did I answer your question? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, uh, Falando do futuro, e pegando a carona da pergunta que o Zé Marcelo fez, uh, qual é o futuro que você imagina para a questão dos direitos autorais e do copyright numa cultura uh, do unfinished, do, do inacabado? Uh, o Brian tem um texto que ele uh, fala de que ele não prefere o, o, o termo inacabado ao termo interativo. Né? E é, se, uma se uma obra de arte vai acontecer uma única vez e ela não vai ser copiada, qual o futuro do copyright e como os artistas podem viver de produção de arte nessa nova cena? E uma outra coisa que eu fico pensando é se eu não vou ter nunca a, a, a experiência usando o, o, o escape, por exemplo, é, a mesma experiência que uma outra pessoa vai ter é, de escutar a mesma música. É, é, qual seria o elo que pode conectar as pessoas e criar um imaginário comum nesse futuro? Sim, então, essa é uma pergunta muito boa. 
Um, sorry. So we've just been through, as a species, we've been through a 120-year period that is unique in human history. And that's the period when we've been able to have exactly the same experience again and again with records, with films, with books, all the different ways of recording. Um, this is unique. Humans have really never been able to do this before. Um, and we've been fascinated by it and intrigued by it. That's why we like loops. <laughs> you know, we're, we can't believe it. We still can't believe that exactly the same thing can happen twice. It's amazing. Nothing in our evolutionary history prepares us for that idea. So now I sense we're getting a bit tired of it. So in England, for example, there are now three or four times as many festivals, music festivals, every year as there were 15 years ago. And my kids go to a lot of them, and I ask them, why do you go? And really the reason they're going is because they know that what they see will never happen again. So they are searching for the unique. Recorded music to them is like water. They just turn it on and they don't pay too much attention to it. What they're really interested in is the special moment where something happens that they know only happened at, at that moment. So I think in some ways generative music partly shares that feeling of being actually like all other human experiences, unrepeatable. Um, you know, when you go and visit uh, a river, for example, it's not the same river you visited last week, <laughs> as Heraclitus so, <laughs> so well said. Um, so the, the feeling is, I think, that we're slightly moving away from our fascination with the duplicate, with the replica. And we're, we're wanting experiences that um, have singularity to them. And the interesting thing about generative forms, such as I described here, is of course that I'm using the technology that was invented to make replicas to make originals. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting step forward, I think. Now, the question of copyright, of course, is very interesting to me since quite a lot of my income comes from copyright. <laughs> um, and I've just decided that that period has passed, really, in many ways. We, we, were, one, we were lucky for a long time. Um, we can't expect it to last forever. You know, for, for 50 years, you could make obscene amounts of money in music because you were making something that was cheap to make that everybody wanted to buy. It's like producing oil, you know. Everybody wants it. You don't have to be very clever to make money at it. So I think it's going to be a little harder in the future. And one of the effects of the... Uh, by the way, I think that there are still possibilities for copywriting and there are still things that should be copyrighted. But um, it's very difficult to imagine how if somebody takes my little app, Scape, and decides to score their new film with it, which they could do, and it would be better than most film scores that you hear, uh, and a fucking lot cheaper too. Um, if they decide to do that, I don't really know that I have any claim to say, you only paid £3.99 for that film soundtrack. <laughs> I want some. I don't think I have a right to do that, really. It's, it's a little bit like if I wrote the program Photoshop or the program Word or, or Microsoft Office. I don't have a right to claim the results that people make with it, I, I think. So it's good, by, it's good by big copyright checks. Brian, I wanted to change a little the rhythm of the conversation. E considerando o seu histórico, considerando... O... So, sorry, I... No, yeah, I didn't have it switched on, sorry. Ok. É, eu queria mudar um pouco o rumo da conversa, é, trazer é, a discussão um pouco 
é, para uma área é, que considera o seu histórico ativista, o seu histórico de é, pessoa que reflete sobre o mundo, sobre as questões políticas do mundo. E é, a gente tem aqui, na cidade do Rio e nos grandes centros urbanos brasileiros, uma realidade muito comum entre essas cidades, que é uma, uma completa falta de planejamento urbano de longo prazo, o que, o que resulta em uma confusão urbana muito grande, é, e também um déficit social histórico de desigualdade, de pobreza e de é, processos é, é, longos de tentativas de inclusão social e de transformação dessa realidade. É, muito tem se feito e pensado e, 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 e se inspirado também em coisas que aconteceram ao redor do mundo, em projetos que aconteceram ao redor do mundo, para se diminuir ou para se resolver esses problemas. É, você teve a experiência de viver em muitas cidades e acompanhar muitas cenas culturais efervescentes e que conseguiram, através da arte, da música e de várias manifestações, e variadas manifestações culturais, transformar realidades seja do ponto de vista é, comportamental, cultural e também social. Eu queria que você fizesse uma reflexão sobre o atual momento desse cruzamento entre a arte e o ativismo. E como que você acha que isso poderia é, ser útil e poderia transformar países como, como o Brasil, que ainda tem esse déficit urbano, social, educacional e etc. Até considerando a presença do Júnior, do Afroreg, ontem aqui, é, que é um grande ativista, um exemplo disso aqui no Brasil, e, a, e por aí vai. Eu queria ouvir um pouco de você sobre isso. Ok, sorry. Um, I had dinner with Junior last night, actually, and and I think he's an amazing person, uh, really very very interesting. He's so smart that I decided I have to learn Portuguese so I can understand what he's what he's saying and the way he's saying it. Um, now, it's interesting that you as a Brazilian should ask this question because as an outsider, when I look at Brazil, I, s I see more interesting social activism in this country than anywhere else in the world. I think this is, this is really a model in many ways, this society, for, for how we might in the future run big inclusive societies. If, if you think of the economies that are doing well right now, which one other than Brazil is doing anything really interesting socially? I don't think any of them. Um, I don't see in China anything very interesting happening socially. There's a lot happening industrially and technologically and so on, but socially it doesn't seem to be moving a lot. Certainly not like you are here. So. So I, funnily enough, this morning I was just writing a letter to my daughters saying why you should come to Brazil. Because <laughs> they're, they're all socially, they're all activists actually, you know, they run campaigns and solidarity committees and everything else. Um, and I thought, can someone answer that phone, do you think? <laughs> no, never mind. Um, uh, okay. Um, I started reading about 12 years ago I started reading the, the for me quite difficult work of a Brazilian thinker called Roberto Mangabeira Unga who is not well known in, in England in fact I've never met anyone in England who's heard of him um, I heard of him because he was mentioned in a book by Richard Rorty who's a philosopher that I like a lot. And this, this position that Unger is taking is so original to me and so fresh. And to think that a man with those ideas is talking to the government, it's impossible to imagine that in England, that somebody with those kinds of thoughts could actually become part of the government. It just doesn't happen. We, we don't use our intellectuals in that way. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've got a camera, I can do whatever I like. <laughs> 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 This 
funny thing I noticed last night when we were doing the show here. The music's playing and the show is going, and suddenly there's this fucking enormous noise. It's the Globo helicopter. <laughs> We've got a camera, we can do whatever we like. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, sorry, so I haven't answered your question. Um, The, I don't like propagandistic art. I don't like it when artists use their ability to manipulate people's emotions to make them take a political position. I think it's cheating. Um, what I would like to think is that people take a position because they feel it's the right position, not because they've been made to weep or sing or whatever else propaganda artists do. So. It's not, it doesn't mean that propagandistic art is necessarily bad art. I mean, there's a, a lot of the Russian social realist art is absolutely fabulous. But I don't like the idea that an artist should think, I know better than you do what you should believe, and I'm going to make you believe it. That sounds like a very dangerous thing. That sounds like doing what, what uh, the Murdoch papers like to do. And just because <laughs> they're on your side, it doesn't make it right. Um, so, so what I think artists can do is to perhaps inspire people to behave like artists when they're thinking about politics. So to jump out of the boxes that politics is put into and to try to start thinking about them, to rethink it creatively, to think, what would I do if this were a work of art. What would I want to see happening here? Um, and again, I think, I think you've seen this happen in Brazil, um, certainly more than anywhere else, where you've seen intelligent uses of um, a combination of um, state and private enterprise, for example. Um, an intelligent, continuous repositioning on this um, long spectrum between command economy and free enterprise. Now, the, this is usually such an ideologically strained and difficult um, discussion to have that governments can't even do it. In England, it's impossible. Um, the government has to either be there, if it's the red one, or there if it's the blue one. Same with the Democrats and Republicans. There are certain subjects that cannot be discussed certain words that can't be used. But this is sort of the opposite, exactly the opposite of being an artist. You know, if, if you're trying to behave as an artist, there are no words that can't be used. There are no colors that can't be mixed. And so, all I think artists can do politically is to try to take their manner of thinking and their manner of approaching things to this difficult subject of politics. <laughs> Brian, uh, there is something that strikes me, that you made, uh, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, the world was picking up speed, and you were already talking about slowing down. Um, you know, everything was going, you know, your t uh, airports were actually being spread everywhere, and you were making music for airports for people to slow down. Um, a few years ago, Anish Kapoor was here, and he said one phrase that's, that um, kept me thinking for quite some time, which is, the last thing that art can still do is slow down time. And I think that, in many ways, uh, what your work is, is more than just a visual, it's more than just a sound, but it's about creating a time experience. It, it can only be experienced within time. If you don't give it time, if you don't respond, even biologically to that time, you do not, you do not enter it. And that, that enters you through that time. I mean, how do you address the issue of time? I mean, I believe that above all, I mean, I'm not talking about your producing work, I'm talking about your visual artist work, yeah. which is, has, in my opinion, time as the main raw material for your work. Well, as, um, as you said, I, I was trained as a painter. I went to art school. 
and like many people who went to art school in England, I left and immediately joined a band. <laughs> it's, it's a very strange mechanism that English art schools produce musicians. Nobody knows quite why that happens, though I have some theories. Um, but when I, when I joined the band, I didn't stop, I didn't lose my interest in visual arts. In fact, I carried on working in that area. And I had my first show in about 1974 or 75, so that was just after I left college. And I've continued having shows ever since. But... The first one I saw of yours was in 1986. Sorry? The first one I saw of yours was in 1986. Okay. He saw my first show in 19, 1986. <laughs> um, um, so, when I started making music, and when, when I, started, I started to realize that I could use this new instrument called the recording studio. By the way, just as an aside, the recording studio is the technology of this time, just like the orchestra was the technology of the 18th century. And the producer is the person who deals with the recording studio. This is why producers are important, because they're the people who understand that technology, just as orchestral composers were the people who understood that technology. But anyway, so I was, I was one of the people who knew how to use that technology. And one of the things I realized was that you could start to make music that was to do with texture and sonic timbre, if you like, sonic ambience, more than you ever could before. So you were really painting with sound. Um, the recording studio made music making much more like painting, in the sense that um, music used to be something that happened in time and that disappeared in time. If you play something, it just disappeared. As soon as you record it, you change it from being something ethereal, something ephemeral, into something physical. As soon as it's on tape or on a disc or on a CD, it exists as a physical object in the world. And you can do the same things to it that you do with a physical object. You can treat it like a painting or like a sculpture. So, anyway, faced with this idea, I started thinking, well, why don't we make a music that is like a painting, that sits still in a room like a painting does? It doesn't attempt to tell a story. It doesn't have climaxes and peaks and valleys and so on. It sits still, like a picture. And then you, the audience, can sometimes look at the picture, sometimes look away from the picture, but it's always there. So this was the beginning of the idea of ambient music. The idea of making a music that acknowledged the fact that modern music was more like painting than traditional music. Um, at the same time, when I started doing these light works, I was really thinking all the time, I'm making paintings but I'm making paintings that behave like music. So I'm making very slowly moving paintings, basically. I mean, this is quite fast here. We've sort of turned the speed up a little bit for Rio because we know how hot-blooded you people are. <laughs> we put it up to full. T tonight we might go a bit slower. Um, but, but anyway, the, so my feeling has been that I've been interested in finding this sweet spot between the static nature of painting and the um, very fast-moving nature of most music. So I've been trying to find this new form, which is, uh, doesn't have a name. <laughs> it's called What Brian Eno Does. <laughs> Any names would be welcome. And, and it is to do with time. Um, so I notice when I show things like this in galleries, the people who don't get them are the people who are used to looking at paintings. Because people who are used to looking at paintings take snapshots. They look, then they look at the label to read about it, 
and then they have another quick look, and then they leave. So I've sometimes seen in galleries the experienced gallery goers walk into one of my shows, have a look, and then leave. Because they think that's what it is. What they see at that moment is what it is. They don't realize that it's going to be changing for the next four and a half million years. <laughs> and, and that they might consider it worth spending 15 minutes there instead. Um, but so, so one of the reasons I have music in my shows is because people understand that music is something that happens in time. They understand that if there's music playing, it's an invitation to stay around for a little bit. And if I can persuade them to stay for about 40 seconds, then they realize, oh, it's changing. <laughs> but most people in the art world are in much too much of a hurry for that because they've, they've got to tick off all the boxes. They've got to see everything in the gallery. You know, 750 paintings. I've got to see them all. And Brian, you know, okay, I've done that. Uh, and so Keith had done that. Uh, okay. um, so, so I'm playing with time a lot, and, and I do it um, even in quite um, subtle ergonomic ways of how do I get people to come into the room? How do I get them to go and sit down? How do I place the chairs so that they're just the right angle to invite you to sit down easily without being self-conscious about the fact that you're sitting down? So there's a lot of um, what the Germans call Zwangsführung, my favorite German word, which means forced progress. Acho que está um pouco na hora de abrir para o público, né? Mas temos uma última pergunta. Não, na verdade estava aqui. Falando com a irmã, eu tinha uma pergunta que ambos gostariam de fazer e que pode ser uma última pergunta antes de abrir. Tem a ver com muito o que se falou aqui e acho que com o espírito da ideia de generative music, eu lembro de um, lembrei de uma fala recente do, do Brian que ele falava sobre as ideias de controle e rendição, né? Control and surrender uh, na nossa existência, na nossa sociedade, na nossa cultura, né? Uh, e o ponto era o quanto nós cultivamos uma cultura que no espectro entre controle e rendição uh, 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 coloca ênfase demais no controle, na ideia de que o gênio, o criador, é quem está no controle de tudo e, é, e, e o líder e, e o nosso papel é esse e todos os outros são aqueles que se rendem. Né? Uh, e o Brian usava a imagem da construção de barcos, a história de construção de barcos, os primeiros barcos eles uh, vazavam água, eles tinham que ser refeitos com frequência, Uh, e que depois o um desenvolvimento das técnicas permitiu criar barcos mais compactos, mas então eles quebravam e foi preciso dar um passo atrás e torná-los mais, uh, criar técnicas que os fizessem flexíveis e que, portanto, para conseguir navegar e vencer grandes distâncias, os grandes barcos e navios tiveram que render-se e não controlar. Essa é a imagem que ele usa para fazer o ponto, que eu acho que tem a ver com muito o que foi falado aqui. Eu queria convidar o Brian a falar um pouco mais sobre isso, para além da, do processo criativo, uh, pensando na nossa cultura, na nossa existência contemporânea. Eu queria só pegar carona rápido. I'm sorry. I, I just would like to, to add a, a very quick point. Um, if you could comment also on the Simon Reynolds hypothesis about retromania, that now every sort of culture is at our disposal, like basically we can get everything that we want, and that is creating actually a sort of repetition in music creation, so we are basically reproducing the, the immediate past and recreating everything. So my question is, are we doomed to repeating the past or the world is actually full of novelty and we just have to find a way uh, of seeing those novelties? Okay, um, I'll, I'll start with this part. So. The last 3,000 years of human history have been distinguished by our increasing ability to control the rest of the world. We can build buildings so we don't get wet. We can build air conditioners so we don't get hot. We can store food. We can make food. We can invent new foods. Um, we can virtualize many aspects of ex our experience. 
um, so that we can, for instance, just have the experience of sweetness without having to eat fruit. Um, there are all sorts of things we can do that make us the highly successful species that we are. And they all seem to fall under the heading of control. They're to do with controlling nature. The strange thing, though, about humans is that they love surrendering. If you think of all the things you really like doing, having sex, taking drugs, <laughs> experiencing art, <laughs> yeah, rock and roll, <laughs> and having religious experiences, apart from taking part in sports and so on and so on, many of the things that we love doing involve a deliberate letting go of control. They involve us doing what seems to be the opposite of what has made us so successful as a species. So I think this is a very, this seems to be a paradox at first, that we spend such a lot of our time trying to, as we say, get out of it, um, trying to get away from being in control. Now, I think this points to something that is overlooked, which is that humans grew up with a repertoire of responses running from surrender to control. We tend to celebrate only the ones at this end, the control ones. Those are the people we give Nobel Prizes to, the people who've helped us understand how we can better control and understand nature. Um, and they deserve their Nobel Prizes. I'm not saying we shouldn't be interested in that. But control is only useful in situations where you know how to control. But there are many, many situations in human life where you don't, where you have to be able to use some different strategy. So I think we spend a lot of our time actually negotiating a spectrum between control and surrender and finding the best uh, blend for our particular circumstance. And my shipbuilding is one of the images I use, but another one is surfing. If you watch people surfing, what they're doing is they're sometimes taking control of the board, jumping onto the next wave, and then they're letting go for the wave to take them. And surfing is completely about knowing when to control and when to surrender. And in that sense, surrender is not a passive activity. It's just another strategy. Surrender is an active thing to do. Um, so surrender isn't giving up. Surrender is making the right choice in, in the circumstance. Now, as I said, humans have a, seem to have a huge appetite for it. Those are the things we like doing for fun. Um, not only for fun, we take it very seriously. Um, and so I think that what a lot of art is about um, is about pr creating a protected space where you can emotionally surrender. The, thing, the main thing about art, which artists don't like to hear, is that art is perfectly safe. That's the great thing about it. You can do the most dangerous things in art because you can always switch the television off, or you can always close the book, or you can always leave the gallery. Um, so we, we're allowed to have these extraordinary emotional experiences precisely because they're not real, because we, we know they're artifacts. And those experiences are our way of constantly rehearsing. This is how we learn how to deal with the world. A child learns through playing. We all know that. You would never stop a child playing. Ch children learn about the world through seeing what it does when they push that over and when they pretend to be the fairy queen and so on. Children learn through play. Adults play through art. This, this is what I think. So art is our way our grown-up way of playing. And it's our way of saying, now I'm going to try being something else for a while. Now I'm going to try a different world from this one. This, by the way, the reason that 
projects to link art and science have nearly always been miserable failures because they are entirely different in their intentions. Science wants to know about this world, art wants to make other worlds. And whenever I've seen art and science projects, they've either been mediocre science, mediocre art, and most often both at the same time. Um, it's a noble ambition to want to say, scientists, scientists and artists are both clever people. Let's put them together and we'll get something really clever. But it doesn't seem to work very often. Um, in response to what you were asking, um, so what fascinated me about hearing this song by this Port St. Willis, is that right? I've forgotten the bloody name now. Port St. Willow. What fascinated me about it was that I knew every ingredient in this song. I could say, oh yes, that's sort of a Velvet Underground thing and that's a bit of a Joy Division thing and that's a little bit of so on. I could trace every route, but the result was new. So I'm, I'm not worried about recombination. That's all that ever happens anyway. You know, the whole history of pop music and every other form of folk music is recombination with mistakes. You know, folk music used to work by you sing a song and I think, oh, that's good, and then I try to sing it and I make a few mistakes. And that's, <laughs> that's the next phase in the life of that song. That's the next mutation, you know. So, so I think popular music has always worked like that. In fact, I think all music has really worked like that. But um, art music tries to pretend that it doesn't work like that. But actually, I think that's how art works in general. It's, it's uh, my take on my particular throw of the dice from, of the possibilities that are available. Occasionally, there is a genuinely new thought that comes into art, but they're very rare. I think mostly we're happy to watch the thoughts that are swimming around selected from, because there are millions of genes <laughs> and memes, and, okay, what happens if I take these ones? What creature do I get from that? Oh, I get Anselm Kiefer. Or, what happens if I take these ones? What do I get from that? Oh, Arto Lindsay. What about those ones? Oh, Brian Eno. You know, um, they, they don't... Ha there doesn't have to be quite as much originality as people think. There's already a lot of stuff around that needs digesting. And in fact, if you look at the history of any art form, pop music is an example, but um, the novel is another example, film is another example, you find that in the earliest years, there's a huge amount of experimentation. There are all sorts of strange things. I mean, if you think, for example, the first 15 years of pop music from 1955 to 1970, that was a long time ago. But in that 15 years, you had so much, so many ideas, many of them ridiculous, but many of them very um, long-lasting. And the same thing happened in the novel. I don't know if any of you have ever read... Um, a book called Tristram Shandy. Does anyone know that book? I, okay, I don't, I don't know if it would translate well into, Brazil, into Portuguese, but it's, it was written in 1780, and it's one of the most ridiculously experimental books ever written. It has blank pages, black pages, has weird typography things, diagrams, holes, all sorts of things, you know. I mean, you look at it and you think, 1780? <laughs> How did they think of doing this then? So, it's typical of a new art form that anyone can do anything. There's no, there's no canon, there's no uh, sort of accepted idea about what ought to be possible. It happened in abstract painting in the early 20th century. If you think of the first 15, 20 years of the 20th century and you think of you know, rayonism, suprematism, constructivism, fauvism, cubism, all those isms. This was people saying, Jesus, I can do anything, and doing it. Um, and then, after that starts to die down, that period, 
you get a very, very long period of digestion. It's like having a huge meal, and then it takes a long time to sort of digest it and see what it's all about. And it takes a lot of sort of analytical time of someone saying, okay, I'm not going to do just anything. I'm going to do this particular experiment. I'm going to take those two ideas and see what they do together. And I'm going to keep doing it a lot of times and see what changes. You know, I'm going to change a little bit of it. Take um, Samuel Beckett, for example. Beckett is a writer who, you, you know, in a way you could say he had one idea. Well, probably two. Um, but they were very good ideas and he was a very rigorous person. He just kept adjusting them, kept trying them out in different relationships to each other. And that's what some artists do. There's nothing wrong with being that kind of artist. Um, I sometimes think that artists, um, you know that song in Oklahoma, the farmer and the cowboy can't be friends. Oh, the farmer and the cowboy can't be friends. You know that? Yeah, I, th I think artists come in two varieties, farmers and cowboys. And the cowboys are the ones who like going out into the frontiers to places that nobody's ever been. And the farmers are the ones who like to put up fences and exploit a piece of land and grow something. So I was a cowboy, but now I'm a farmer. <laughs> Duas breves perguntas e aí a gente termina. Vamos lá, quem se joga aqui? Pega o microfone. Um, hello, Brian. Thank you for, uh, for being here. My name is Cecilia. I'm a uh, PhD student in engineering and environment. And I've been listening to your music for a while. And I'm quite surprised at how articulate you are. I have... <laughs> um, I didn't... You're not so bad yourself. I, did, I didn't mean that as a compliment, but <laughs> um, I've had a bias. Uh, I'm also a bit of an artist. I also paint. And uh, I've, I've always had a bit of a bias as to how artists are very inarticulate. You know, when you, when you look at autobiographies from way back, there are a few exceptions. But in general, um, you know, uh, Arthur Rubinstein was quite articulate. And there are exceptions. And nowadays, you see people like Keith Richards, who can't even write himself. He, has to have someone else. So I'm really quite impressed. And this, this leads back to, since you mentioned literature now, you mentioned Beckett, I was reminded of some of your early works in which you use words, sounds, the, the syllables, as part of the music. And I know that this is a long time ago and you probably don't want to talk about it, but uh, <laughs> for instance, um, the king's lead hat is a model to desire, the, the lyrics in Before and After Science uh, I had always had a sense that you used words as part of your music. And since we've been talking about the multidisciplinary aspect of your art, painting, your, uh, basically painting and music, I'm, I've been thinking of this third dimension, which is words. You know, and since you're articulate, uh, I've been wondering, is it, should I continue with this bias of mine? And should I ignore what artists have to say about themselves and just look at their work? Or should I open myself up to reading autobiographies and uh, looking at what, uh, for instance, when I read Proust for the first time, I had a friend who said... Is this a question? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so I want to know, should I get rid of my bias or not? I'm sorry I extended myself. Um, I, I agree with you that artists are generally poor at articulating what they, they're doing. And are even suspicious of it. They, they seem to think that if you can talk about it, it might go away. You know, that you might burst the bubble by talking about it. Whereas, I know a lot of scientists, and of course scientists have to speak in a public language. That's what science is. Science is a public language. By definition, it must be a public language. So, scientists are much more rewarding conversationalists at dinner than artists. But artists have much better parties than scientists. <laughs> so, so, 
Um, but that's, that's not a trivial point, actually. It's true in a way. Because in a sense, um, you can see in that analogy that the problem that um, scientists are very good at using this and often not very aware of the rest of it, which is why we got the mouse. You know? And artists are very good at using the rest of it and not very fluent with using this. So, of course, we would, we would like everybody to be able to do both. And um, I, I don't know why artists aren't good at it, but they really aren't very good at conversing very much. And I, I think it's partly because of the complete bullshit conversation that surrounds the art world. It, you know, the worst writing you will ever read is, is what art critics come up with. It is an absolute tragedy that people should be paid for shuffling together obscure French words um, in that way. And I really look forward to the end of that type of writing because I think it would liberate artists because I think they're constrained by it. They think they ought to talk about their work in that way. You know, they ought to be able to quote Lacan and Deleuze and everybody else, or else they're not properly talking about their work. And I'm so sick of that shit. Um, so, so I blame the critics, not the artists. <laughs> okay. well, you were going, sorry, I just, just a second. I thought you were, you were about to say something, weren't you? Oh, no, maybe not. Sorry. Didn't want to cut you off. Sorry. I have a... Um, I know you don't want to talk about um, no, all I things don't. you did, so I, I, no. I'll, I'll just say Plateau of Mirror, Wrong Way Up, and Apollo, thank you very much. Uh, I, I've played for hours with Apollo because I'll never be an astronaut, much as I wanted to be, but Apollo takes me there. I wonder, though, about things that are new, uh, if you could say a few words about what's coming out next month, uh, looks, and um, the other question I had is, years ago on the back of an album, you described a stereo system that you came across, this three-speaker system. The Hafla system, yeah. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've put it together many times in many places I've lived, worked like a charm, and I wonder if you could talk about that as well. Well, it's a very simple idea. Um, invented by a man called Hafla. <laughs> it's called the Hafla system. And uh, actually, you, it's probably harder to do now because so many music systems are all integrally wired up in advance, so you can't, you can't get inside them. But essentially what you used to do was take the positive and negative going to, of the two speakers going to the amp in the normal way. I can't do this and hold this for me. Really. <laughs> so, so you have an amplifier with two, with positive and negative, positive and negative, left and right. Ordinary speakers are wired like that. But then you take a third speaker which runs from the positive on one side to the positive on the other. And, and what that speaker does is it, it automatically gives you the difference between the two channels. Um, so, for instance, in a, in a live recording, it would give you everything that wasn't in the center of the recording, which is the room reverberation in particular. So it's a way of creating, a, a very cheap way of creating a, um, a three-dimensional sound experience. Ah, you should all try it, but you won't. <laughs> Nobody does that kind of thing now, do they? They're so lazy. <laughs> Oh yes, so I've got, I've got a new album coming out, but now if I talk about that, people will think I just did this to promote that album. <laughs> so I'm not going to say anything about it at all. In fact, I'm going to say I wouldn't buy it if I were you. <laughs> okay. Five. Da, da. Uh, my name is Francisco, I'm 62, I'm from Rio, and for, I think, in the 90s, uh, 40 years ago, I was in Cambridge doing uh, an English course for foreign students, and I went to London and saw one of your first gigs in a, in a kind of festival. But 
that's uh, my question is the capac the capability of hearing of listening i you wrote sometimes uh, some some years ago that uh, eu não sei se eu, eu, tem alguém para traduzir eu fico tem, tem, tem você falou em estafa auditiva ou seja a capacidade a, a pessoa chega num ponto e não consegue escutar mais eu queria te perguntar se você já passou dessa fase às vezes eu eu escuto muito música qualquer coisa assim mas chega uma hora que a capacidade da gente escutar é limitada até que ponto e se você ainda ainda tem essa estafa auditiva eu não sei traduzir isso em inglês obrigado um, I, I don't listen to that much music actually um, except the music that I'm working on so one of the big drawbacks about being a composer is that you can't listen to music while you're doing it. That's, that's the biggest problem, actually, because I love having the radio on, but I, can't, I have to switch it off when I'm composing a, a new record, like my new record, Lux, which is coming out on November the 12th, <laughs> and is very good. <laughs> um, but, but I don't... I have these methods, like I mentioned earlier, of making sure I don't keep listening to the same things again. I, I only really have two ways of listening. One is to listen to my old faithfuls that I still love, like the Golden Gate Quartet, the, the recordings they made in August 1937. I listen to something of theirs, I would say, at least five times a week. This is an a cappella gospel group from Norfolk, Virginia, And I never get tired of listening to that because it's the most minimalist and most exciting music that I can think of. And then, on the other hand, I have these ways of the Carruthers technique, various others, of making sure I hear new things um, and I'm surprised by them. But I, I probably only listen to music maybe that that is not the music I'm working on maybe two or three hours a week something like that so it's probably less than any of you because you've all got jobs where you can listen to music you see okay gente muito obrigado thank you very much Brian obrigado a vocês todos